Don't know if you've ever felt that way or not, but um, we're going to uh, be taking a look at in our series this morning um, the topic, does the Bible really say God won't give you more than you can bear? It's really good to see each and every one of you here this morning and those that are joining us by the streaming services and all that. I was delighted this morning to see a young lady back there by the name of Catherine. Catherine, can you wave at us? Come on, lift your hand up, wave at us here, okay? That's Catherine sitting on the very back row back there. Months ago, I don't know, six months ago or more, she was paralyzed. She couldn't talk and movement, and uh, we began to pray with the Hernandez family and, and believing God for God to touch her, and she walked into this service to morning, this morning. Come on. God bless you, Catherine. So great to see you. Today, my prayer is in this service, as well as if you're joining us by streaming, that this service and this time around God's Word will be a source of healing and hope to people whose hearts are heavy and broken. Perhaps you're lonely. Perhaps you're desperate. Perhaps your body is racked with pain because of chronic illness and disease. Perhaps the unbelievable pressures of life are weighing heavily on you. And, and you wonder, where's God? You know, I'm, I'm praying with the De La Rosa family this morning. Um, many of you are aware that this past weekend, um, here on Friday night, probably around 300 people gathered to say goodbye to Lindsay, a woman in the prime of her life. She was in her early 30s, raising four beautiful children, ranging from preschoolers to, high school, uh, to teenagers. And the morning hours of her driving two weeks ago, she unexpectedly, never had a history of this before, she unexpectedly had a seizure, lost control, hit a tree, and died. Died instantly. Let me stop here and say this, though. The Sunday before that happened, she was sitting in the service right over here, responded to the altar call, and gave her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we are able to sorrow, but not as those without hope. Um, to say that their hearts are broken is an understatement. The compound pain that's there. And, and to think about just five years ago this week, the De La Rosa family had another family member, Tito, who passed away suddenly. Olivia's husband, this is her daughter, Lindsay, but her husband, five years ago this week, died at work, unbeknownst an aneurysm, and he dropped over dead. Again, to say that they are heartbroken is an understatement. So, so what do you say? at times like that? And what does the Bible say in these seasons? Does, does the Bible really say God won't give you more than you can bear? How many have heard that statement before? God won't give you more than you can bear. How many of you, like me, have even said that to somebody at one time or another? God won't give you more than you can bear. I, I said it as well. I, I know it's, it's our it's our feeble attempt or our desire to say something that is comforting. But I think if you think about it, and we'll get more into this in a moment, that's not really comforting. Um, there, there are many dynamics on that, that whole thing. Um, some say that this is based on a, on a scripture text. You can't find those exact words, God won't give you more than you can bear in the, in the Bible. But there is a text that some people point to and say, well, that's where this, is, this idea comes from. Let's take a look at the text together. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. If you have your Bible, go there. We'll, we'll look at this chapter a little bit more as well as some other scriptures as well. Um, let's read it out loud and, uh, together and then we're going to pray. 
Read it out loud with me, would you please? No temptation has seized you except what is common to men. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Father, I thank you that your word is true. I thank you that you've also said that your word would never return void. It would always, it would always make an effect. It would always be effective in our lives. And, and Lord, I, I thank you today for the anointing of the Spirit of God to speak the truth of God. And I pray, Lord, not only that you would anoint me, I thank you for that mantle that you placed upon my shoulders to pastor here at Abundant Life Church. I thank you for that privilege. But I thank you right now, O oh God, for an anointing upon every heart and ear and mind to receive your word today and to, Lord, to be encouraged today by the truth of your word in Jesus' name and everyone who agreed said. Now, I, I want to tell you right up front, I don't believe that this text says or supports this common axiom, God won't give you more than you can bear. Let me show you why. Let's dig into it. So, first of all, what does he will not tempt, you will not be tempted more than you can bear. You will not be tempted more than you can bear. What does that mean? Well, if you look in the Greek lexicon, if you look in a Greek dictionary, um, you know, you'll find that there are numerous meanings for this word. Now, now, we know in our English language that there are certain words, actually there are numerous words that are spelled the same, they're pronounced the same, and yet they have very different meanings. I don't know if you noticed or not, but uh, this wasn't so that I could have breakfast this morning, but I went into our pantry at home and I dug out a jar of Smucker's Red Raspberry Jam. Oh, there's somebody that likes that, huh? Well, you know, it, it's, it's not been opened yet. Actually, I think this is, uh, above all else jams, this is Elka's favorite. So I'll get it back for you, Elka. <laughs> But I brought this to, to illustrate the fact that there are certain words in the English language pronounced the same, um, spelled the same, and they, depending on how you're using it, don't necessarily mean the same. This is jam, but some of us have been in a jam before, right? Doesn't mean we've been in this jar, especially in the met Metroplex, you've been in a jam, right? There's the traffic jam. And then there's times we talk about that we've got so much going on that we're in a jam, you know. So words that sound the same, spell the same, but depending on how we um, use them. One other illustration of this real quick because it, it highlights that. I went out into the garage and I got a box of nails. Words spelled the same pronounced the same, you know, there, there are times where we talk about people nailing it, right? Well, they, they nail it, it means that they got it, or they might have used this in a hammer and uh, attached a two-by-four or siding or something like that. So uh, I think you get the point. It can go on. We can talk about the word pool. We can talk about the word mine. Uh, all of those, those different things. And this leads me back to the text. Many people think or believe that God won't give you more than you can handle or bear is supported by the verse because the Greek words there have multiple meanings. Clearly, the word tempted in the Greek can refer to temptation to sin. It can also refer to a trial. It can also refer to a type of suffering. Now, the Greek word here used for temptation uh, can speak of suffering and sin. But if you look at the Greek lexicon, it will show that testing or trial is a possible way to use this word. Why then would I say it's wrong to use this as scriptural support and claim this verse as God won't give you a test more than you can bear? 
Well, because of this word context. Come on, say it together with me again. Context. Again, the way I use the word jam determines its meaning, what I intend for it to mean, whether it's this jar of jam or whether I'm jammed up in traffic. And so the context is really important. And you know, an, an important thing, this is why we study the Bible together, is, is we, we, we have to understand the true meaning and context denotes what the true meaning is. And many times people say uh, that the Bible says this when it's pulled out of context. I can... I can intend to communicate jam as in the jar, or I can, I can intend to communicate jam as in, uh, you know, there's just so much going on or traffic won't flow. But I can't intend both meanings at the same time. Unless, of course, it's a pun, right? You know, we can... If, a pun plays on words that way. But there's no one that believes that Paul, in this direction to the Corinthians and to Christians, uh, by and large, is intending a pun. So only one meaning fits with the correct rules of interpretation. And when we look at the context of the passage to determine which meaning Paul intended, we find that he is addressing sin and not suffering. Look at verse 6. If you have your Bibles, your smartphone, the Bible on your smartphone, your book that you bring with you, hardbound, leatherbound, verse 6 tells us Paul's talking about keeping from evil things. And verse 7, he addresses idolatry, showing the context of the passage that idolatry is sin. Verse 8 identifies this idolatry specifically as sexual immorality. And then the following verses continue to address sin as we read of putting uh, Christ to the test in verse 9 and grumbling in verse 10. And then verse 12 gives this exhortation so that if you think you're standing, be careful that you don't fall. Verse 13, which is our text this morning, that many might point to and say, God won't give you more than you can bear. Verse 13, the context, continues to address sin within the context of these verses. And the plain reading of this text should lead us to conclude that Paul used or chose to use the word temptation to address temptation to sin, not trials, not suffering in this passage. Therefore, I submit to you, trying to build my case this morning, therefore, I submit to you this verse does not stand the test to say God won't give us more than we can handle or bear. So we've just talked about how important the context is. What, what about the entire Bible? You know? So we ought to ask, what does the Bible really say about God not giving? What examples can we see throughout the Word of God? Well, first of all, consider what Paul says. Paul has written this verse, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, Paul says, brothers, we don't want you to be uninformed about the hardships. Anybody going through a hardship? Anybody have gone through a hardship? about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure. There's some of you in this room that are under great pressure. Far, look, look at this phrase. Far beyond our ability to endure. Far beyond what we could hold up under. So that we even despaired of life. Indeed, our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. We sang it this morning, alive forevermore. 
He has delivered us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So don't miss this. Paul, first of all, states we were under so much was happening in our lives. Uh, we felt despair to the point of despairing of life itself, and it was far beyond our ability to endure. If Paul could stand here today, he'd say, I faced so much pain, so much pressure, so much hardship in my life as a Christian that I finally had to admit as a sufferer, I was powerless to help myself. You can't deny the fact by reading this text that it was what he felt was beyond what he could bear. So the point here is to understand that sometimes we as believers hurt so much or are under so much that we feel like, as the woman in that first uh, video God, where are you? Why, why is this happening to me? I, I, I can't bear this alone. I, I want you to also consider Jesus as an example. Now, I realize, and I wrestled with this as I put this together, you know, we, we tend to feel like that, you know, Jesus, he's able to get through things because he's Jesus. He's God in the flesh. And, and there's that that conundrum that's there of, uh, of him being fully God and fully man. But as man, we know that he, he faced everything that we faced. He faced all the principles that we face and all of the, the pressure and the tempting and that. And I want you to see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus in Matthew 26, 36 through 38, it says Jesus went with his disciples to, to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be, look at this, sorrowful and troubled. That's the fully man part of Jesus, isn't it? And then he said to them, and look at his humanity here, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. The emotional power of the original language here can literally get lost in translation. That's, that's why sometimes, you know, there are some words that just don't translate well from one language to another. You know, Erna at times will tell Elka and I, you know, her first language was German. You, you just can't trans, there's no translation for this word. And, and in Greek, I'm sure that there are limited translations in it. And, and many of you have spoken other languages and know the truth of that as well. Matthew 26, 38 is translated the following ways in our English Bibles. Overwhelmed with sorrow in the NIV. The uh, English Standard Version says very sorrowful. The New American Standard Bible says deeply grieved. The New Living Translation, uh, Jesus says he's crushed with grief. And there's another that says of him being swallowed up in sorrow. Why is this so important? And why make so much of it? Because in life at times, and some of you are at this place right now, life at times is more than we can bear. And when it is, if we have heard someone say this, or if we thought this is true, we have a skewed view. And when we have this skewed view, it can cause guilt and confusion for us. For instance, you know, the confusion is when you say God won't give you more than you can bear, you are saying that God did this or gave this to you. 
Now, I, I will admit there are times where, where something happens. It may be from the hand of God, but it isn't always. We, we know, see, I, I don't believe God kills anybody. I believe that what the Bible says clearly, that death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. And clearly, death was brought into this planet uh, when, when men embraced sin, when original sin came and, and touched the hearts. God didn't intend that for us at all, but the consequences of our sin have brought all of this about. So if we take and accept this, God won't give us, then we begin to think, God, why are you doing this to me? That's not always the case. And then beyond that, as you think, won't give you more than you can bear, when you're at the place that the Apostle Paul was, or at the place that Jesus is, or at the place that many people are today, when you're not bearing up under it, you think, what's wrong with me? If I just read the Bible more, if I just prayed more, if I, if, if, if I just listened to worship music more. You know, there, there's this guilt that begins to take a load into our lives beyond even the weight of what we're going through. You know, if and when, and it's just a matter of time for all of us, we reach this place far beyond our ability to endure. And like Paul, we despair of life. Then... It gives room for the enemy if we have a twisted or skewed view. You see, the, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he will, he will whisper that there must be something wrong with your walk with God if you feel like you just don't want to go on. Despaired of even life itself. That's the danger of this statement. There are multiple peoples under, under, uh, that are believers, that are followers of Christ, that are they're, uh, unbearable pressure, and they, they've, they've even passed the breaking point. They're struggling with the death of a spouse or a child or, or a divorce or a job loss or a cancer diagnosis or, or the infidelity of a spouse. Or, or a teenager that's just so out of control and been arrested with, or, or a family member that, that's uh, got dementia or Alzheimer's. And when they hear the statement, God won't put on you more than you can bear, they say, What's wrong with me? Well, I. I believe that the Bible teaches something in regard to that, and it teaches that what we need to do is take the focus off of us. See, the focus is God won't give you more than you can bear. But what if we take the focus off of us and say God is the one that we need to be looking to. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 with me. Uh, if you have your smart device or your Bible with you, go there. I want you to see this. I want you to see it. I want it to get into your spirit and your heart. We read it just a moment ago, but the latter part of this is, is the reflection of how we change our focus and what God will do when we reach this place that it is beyond our ability to bear. The apostle said, but this happened that we might not, what, rely on ourselves but on God. Say that with me. Not on ourselves but on God who was raised from the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us on him, on him, not on my ability to bear it, not on my ability to stand up underneath it, but on him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you have helped us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. 
First of all, note this. I, I confess it to you today. I can't make it without God's help. I am not strong enough to bear under some of the pressures of life that happen. I cannot make it without God's help. Verse 10 says, I must rely on Him. It's in Him that I cast my care on Him. It's on His power, not my power. It's on His ability, not my ability. On Him we have set our hope that He will continue to deliver us. Secondly, I want you to see here that I, uh, and, and, and I, I tell you this, I confess this to you, so that you might not only hear it from me, but that you might do it for me. I confess to you that I can't make it without your prayers. I hope that you pray for your pastor. I hope you pray for your staff. But the, the, the truth here is, is that you and I can't make it without each other's prayers. Paul says here, as you help us by your prayers. Oh, I pray that you're led of the Spirit in praying for people. Are, are there times, don't respond, but mentally respond. Are there times during the week you think about a brother or sister in the Lord? You think about somebody you've met at church? You think about the prayer request, and all of a sudden it comes to you, and, and, and when it comes to you and you're thinking about them, you are led of the Spirit, and you begin to pray for them. I know we're so distracted in our society. We're distracted by many things. Our driving isn't the only thing that's distracted. Our spiritual walk, our, our spiritual disciplines are often distracted by things that are going on in our life. But Paul says, I can't make it. I'm going to be helped by your prayers. We need each other. Come on, say that with me. We need each other. We need to pray for one another. We need to encourage one another. You know, in regard to this topic, does the Bible really say God won't give you more than you can bear? A great preacher one time by the name of Howard Hendricks made an observation. He said, Sometimes life gets so tough that you don't just hit rock bottom, you crash through it. Such a good picture for us to look at this morning. Would you stand together with me, please, every head bowed and eye closed?